Hey, thanks for listening to our podcast. If you want to listen live in the central Indiana area, you can hear us on 93.5 FM and 107.5 FM. From playing in a phone booth, becoming a Morse Reservoir All-Star, and earning status as an Ambien player, it's time for the best of Coach Rick Venturi with a breakdown of yesterday's game. Brought to you by the District Tap. Craft beer on tap and damn good food. North at 82nd Street, just east of Keystone at the Crossing. And now downtown at Georgia Street in Meridian. The easiest hour of radio that JMB gets to do every week is today my easiest hour of radio I do in this three and a half hour tour. We just sat back and let the man go. That would be Rick Venturi who joins us now. Happy New Year, my friend. How you doing? Oh, Greg, happy New Year to you. Um, I actually thought about you directly yesterday on the Saints play at the end of the game on the interference call. You know, whether you agree with it or not, I think just let them play. is right. fine with me. I don't have any trouble with it. But I thought back to our preseason games when we were doing those games, and I told you then, <laughs> those officials, those guys aren't going to change any of these calls. They didn't, they didn't want that rule. That was the coach's rule, and they were going to make sure that you never, they never changed it. Unless you were holding for five yards, you weren't going to get called. So I really did. I thought we, we picked that way back. Back in uh, way back in August, but what a weekend, Greg! Uh, you know those people that forecasted the uh, the death of the NFL in the last couple of years, they, they might as well just go bet on the horses because I don't think they're going to win that one. I uh, it was just a tremendous weekend, as good a weekend the NFL has had in a long, long time. I mean, four just tremendous football games, drama down to the wire, overtimes. Uh, controversial stuff, everything that you that you really want, and you know I I come down from that and I look forward to this weekend because to me personally this weekend is the biggest weekend yep. in football. You got the you know you got the quarterfinals, you got the elite eight, and and let's face it, at this time, uh, regardless of, of where you were in September. The eight teams that are alive here today really belong to be here. And so you're going to have that. And then it's going to be followed by Monday night's NCAA championship, uh, you know, which uh, how, how can you beat that with, uh, you know, the two programs that are going to go at it, the, uh, the Bayou Tigers and the Tigers from Clemson, both teams kind of noted for their Death Valley days. So, yeah, it's, it's just going to be great. I, I, can't fo- I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to this weekend after a great weekend this time. All right, Vikings' biggest surprise yesterday, or, or do you reserve, or you reserve, I should say this weekend, or do you reserve that for somebody else? No, I, I think the Vikings in that, I think that, I, I think basically the prohibitive favor. I think everybody, they favored New England, but you worried about New England. I, I've said it all along. This was not a really good New England team. He was surviving on defense, and that, you know, that starts to wear out, and it kind of wore out there at the end. But offensively, the Patriots have been putrid. I mean, they, they count on a triangle of three, and they've never had the third part of that triangle this year. They've just never been able to place Gronk or the wide receiver. Uh, the Antonio Brown thing went south on them. So it came down to Edelman and White in a running game. And trust me, teams are smart enough to take that away, and they did. I'd, I'd have to say Minnesota because I think that New Orleans in some ways was a prohibitive favorite, uh, certainly the biggest favorite out of Vegas, uh, and playing in that monster that is the uh, Mercedes Dome down there uh, will always be the New Orleans Superdome sure. to me. But the the Mercedes Dome uh, with Breeze as hot as he was, certainly as hot as we saw him. Um, and and at the end of the day, and and Sean said it today, is that Minnesota really, in my opinion, it wasn't just that they won it. It's just I thought that they just outplayed them totally, Greg. I thought that they, you know, basically. Their defense really dominated the Saints. Really, if it isn't for, you know, Taysom uh, Hill coming in there and kind of doing the crazy stuff, you know, they basically about shut New Orleans out. I mean, really, New Orleans is getting nothing, you know, with a guy that went 29 for 30 against us. I mean, they can't move it. And, of course, Taysom Hill puts them back in the game with uh, all kinds of uh, stuff that he does. But I thought that Minnesota's defense, particularly the front four, just made nonsense out of the Saints' offensive line. And you could see it. I thought you could see, and I'm I'm very attuned to this, 
and and I particularly like the TV game because I think you can see it. Um, I, I thought I thought Drew Brees' body language was going down, down, down as the game went on. I think he realized early that they weren't going to hold up when they had Everson Griffin come inside on the guards on Pete and then Hunter. Uh, and that's where you got to get Breeze. You got to get Breeze inside. He's going to step underneath the outside rush, and what you got to do is beat those guys inside. And they did that. And then I thought that Zimmer's team played really, really smart on offense. Uh, they're kind of, you know, the Vikings to me, and I'm, I'm just kind of catching up to the NFC to be honest sure. with you. But the Vikings, to me, are kind of like a, a remnant of the old black and blue division that we knew. I don't know that that exists anymore, but, you know, the old black and blue, which was now the NFC North, uh, you know, which was, a you know, Vince Lombardi, uh, Bud Grant. I mean, to me, they run the ball extremely well. Uh, Dalvin Cook is a tremendous player. Um, you know, big emphasis on the tight ends right down to the last play to Rudolph. But Irv Smith is also very good, good up front. And then they got the franchise game out of, co- out of Cousins. You know, I mean, I, I you know, when, when Aikman said it, I, I thought it was a good statement. He said that's the biggest throw of his life, yep. you know, when he, when he threw the, the, post, the post corner back over there. I mean, that was just an absolute throw. And, you know, then to hit the, you know, hit the jump ball fade, at the very end, but Cousins played good all day. And, you know, as I get ready for the final eight, uh, as I get ready here and I do a trem- I do a big analytical breakdown on each team and then, you know, see if it matches up to what I see on the tape. And, of course, Baltimore just in, in terms of statistically – uh, there isn't anybody close to them. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to win it because you don't play it on the stats. But statistically, they're very good. And probably San Francisco is second uh, in terms of statistical breakdowns. But I'll tell you what, when you really analyze in and out on the Vikings, assuming they can get that kind of game from Cousins, you know, they're not very far behind. They're right up there. They're much better statistically when you look at all the different things they do than I expected going in, Greg. So I think that's going to – that may be the most interesting game. Uh, they're all going to be interesting, but that, that might be the one that I think San Francisco will be a pretty good favorite. I think that's going to be a really good game, and I'm really interested because I these games, to me, are so good in many respects coming up. Number one, you have five quarterbacks that are just always in the MVP conversation. I mean, you got – the three young kids who make me very happy to be doing the games with you in the booth <laughs> and not calling defense. And that's, you know, that's Marcus Jackson, you know, that's Mahomes. And then what could you say about Deshaun Watson? I mean, those three guys, they, they not only can play the playbook, they take it way beyond the playbook. And that's what, you know, as a defensive coordinator all those years, those are the things that just give you tremendous headaches, guys that – can take it uh, beyond the playbook. You know, Elway was that way. But these guys are so unique. And then Jackson, of course, brings the Saturday game. He brings the college game. And Baltimore has been smart enough to say, hey, we're going to go full metal jacket with this. The hell with it. We're going to win now. We're not going to worry about 20 years. We're going to win right Right. now. We're going to do what he can do. And then you have the two veteran MVPs. you got – uh, you got Russell, who just carries the franchise. It's just he's just absolutely amazing. His focus, his ability to play, escape, throw from the pocket. I mean, you have to have Canyones, and you have to have confidence when you're trying to kill that clock and you throw that big fade to Metcalf. I mean, at the end, you have to have complete trust in your quarterback. I thought it was so cool, and, and I looked for little things. He was so focused that he didn't know if they were going to Wisconsin next week or where. They asked him that question after the game. He said, are we going to Wisconsin? He was so into that game. And then you have Rodgers, who on paper, really on, of, of all the quarterbacks, he has the worst QBR of the eight going in. But you know that this guy – probably three years ago, and I don't think he's regressed that much, was considered the most difficult guy to play in the league. So, again, you got five MVPs. Uh, you got three guys that are on their second run that are playing their ass off. I mean, you got Jimmy G, who's gotten his opportunity and has played really well. Cousins, who, you know, everybody criticizes and, you know, you know looked lights out yesterday. 
And then I think one of my favorite stories this year, unfortunately for us, but one of my favorite stories is the Tannehill story because he has just played his tail off, and they're the they're kind of the quiet outlier in the series, but you can't count them out because – I think the whole is much greater than the parts. Now, they probably have the biggest challenge going to Baltimore. But the quarterback situation is phenomenal. Um, you know, when you look at the coaches, you got a mixture of guys. Um, you know, you've got guys that were defensive guys like uh, Iconic, you know, uh, you know uh, Pete Carroll, uh, you know, Zimmer, who was one of the great defensive coaches uh, first, Mike Vrabel, who comes from the defensive profile, and then John Harbaugh, who's kind of a combination defensive special teams guy. And then, of course, you have the offensive gurus on the other side. You know, you, you really do. And it's so it's really amazing. It's kind of a 4-4 split. And it's, uh, but uh, if, you, if you really peel the onion, a lot of veteran coordinators in this thing. This is, this is really the best of the best. And it's, you know, it's, and it's kind of refreshing. Obviously, there, there's a warmth in my heart for New Orleans and, you know, I hate to see them three straight years on this, but it is what it is. You you know, you, you get what you, you know, whatever whatever that result is, that's who you are. Um, but it's a little bit of a passing of the guard, too. I mean, it's it's refreshing that we don't have to talk about the Patriots anymore. You know, we, you know the Saints are out of it, so Breeze is out of it, Brady's out of it. So all these new faces, and I mean literally the new faces of the NFL – and I mean that figuratively and literally. I mean, we have four great young quarterbacks that are leaders, smart, great athletes that happen to be black as well. I mean, I, I come from – I remember a time when that was impossible. I mean, this is just a, a tremendous – like I said, it's just a tremendous cross-section of of players and teams going into it. And, uh, you know, I told Sherry, no chores this weekend now. No, there's, no, there's nothing, Christmas stuff down, uh, absolutely nothing. The honeydew list stops <laughs> on stopped. Saturday and Sunday because Coach stopped. has stuff to do. One question, one segment. Back in a moment with more with Rick here on 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. From playing in a phone booth, becoming a Morse Reservoir All-Star, and earning status as an ambient player, it's time for the best of Coach Rick Venturi with a breakdown of yesterday's game. Brought to you by the District Tap. Craft beer on tap and damn good food. North at 82nd Street, just east of Keystone at the Crossing. And now downtown at Georgia Street in Meridian. Once again, back with Rick Venturi, Greg Rakestraw in for JMB here on 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. You and I were having a little conversation during the break. And again, you don't have to worry about how you scheme up against Lamar Jackson these days, hanging in the booth with me during preseason football games. But Tennessee kind of has to worry about how you slow him down. If you're Mike Vrabel and company, how are you getting the job done if you can get the job done this weekend? Well, you're going to have to force him to, you know, to, to win in a drop-back situation. You're going to have to stop the run. And the run now is not obviously a classic run. This is a run that is not only physical, but it is a run that, you know, is 11-gap run with him. So you're going to have to play, you know, you're going to have to play split safeties. You're going to have to have safeties or corner blitzes around that box because you don't want to give him any space. You don't want to get one-on-ones to that perimeter. So, you know, you really have to, you know, you know, going into this thing, and anybody worth their salt would have had to study the game, the, the college game in the offseason because we're going that way. Now, I think that Tennessee, believe it or not, has a decent team to do this because they have – Really good linebackers. They they really do. Um, you know, and and they're good linebackers that can run to the edge. Brown and Evans, and if Brown's nicked up, you, you know, you still have Woodyard. So, you know, they have speed to the perimeter, and they have two really good safeties. Now, you know, that is Byard and Vaccaro, and I think that's really critical because, you know, it's like playing the college game today is, you know, the college game now has forced teams to, and, you know, the safeties, we used to hide safeties. Safeties were average athletes. One guy was a box guy. One guy was a center fielder. Well, now with these kinds of quarterbacks that put the pressure, add the gaps to the outside, you've got to have safeties that are athlete enough to be able to come down quickly and make a tackle. And then what you hope to get is, 
you know, by the reading of the scheme, you, you hope to get another half a man to him. And I, I think that's the critical thing, because what you what you got to do eventually is make him operate out of the pocket on third and long, because even though he's coming on there, that's still the part of his game that is not he is not Mahomes or Deshaun Watson out of the pocket. Now, he's again, the way they play him, he's absolutely phenomenal and a headache, but it is more on the movement on the zone read, on all those kind of action passes that makes him good. So, you know, you basically have to stop him, and yet, you know, when they go to the play action, I, I think the other part of it is you don't want to give anything up deep. You you want to make him have to be patient, and, and that's going to be the challenge. The challenge is going to be the safeties reading that stuff and being able to come up and play that run when they have to and and then get their butt back out of there when they read the pass. That's that's the challenge. But I, I think Tennessee actually is decently suited because, like I said, you know, they've got linebackers that can go and, and I do think I do think those two safeties are pretty doggone good. I mean they can insert themselves, particularly on the run, uh both Byers and Vaccaro. So I mean, I think they got a chance to do it, but, the, you know, the challenge is immense. And, you know, Baltimore's an immense challenge, period. I mean, when you, you know, when you look at Baltimore, it's, it's, it's amazing. The big three stats, you know, that I use, I, I always use the big three. I tell you all the time uh, before I look at a tape, that's points given up, uh, a quarterback QBR, not the passer rating, the QBR, and turnover differential. Well, <laughs> Baltimore is number one. Uh, in terms of fewest points given up, um, you know, they the QBR, he is number one in their turnover differential. They're a plus 16. So, uh, you know, you're going to have to go up. <laughs> you really, the challenge is immense. Um, you know, Tennessee's kind of that house money team, though. You know, that team that nobody gives a chance to. Right. And, and I've always said this about Tennessee even when we were getting ready for them. Is I think Tennessee's a team, Greg, that is the whole is greater to, than the parts, and they've got a runner that can ball control you. The biggest surprise in the New England game to me was not the inefficiency of the of the uh, New England offense and Tom Brady. I I that didn't surprise me a bit. I've seen it all year. What surprised me was that he could no one no one going in how good he was that a Bill Belichick defense would give him up 182 yards running. I, I That is just shocking to me because being around Bill, you he he never, leads, never lets that guy beat you that you know can beat you, and they sure as hell did. So they can ball control. Um, their defense will I'll be challenged. We'll see. And I think Tannehill's just played his tail off. I, I really do. I'm just uh, utterly amazed. Miami's got to be scratching their head a little bit because now they're going to be forced to draft a guy. All right, before, before we get to our next time, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. I'm going to save the national championship talk for next week with JMB, knowing the game is next Monday night. Uh, I know that you have a tie to Mike McCarthy, who today was named as the new head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. We haven't talked about this yet on the show today. Your thoughts about the move and how good of a fit he is for the Dallas Cowboys. Well, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to death. I mean, Mike McCarthy is a, a great guy. And he's a terrific football coach. I mean, I think he got the shaft at Green Bay. I also think that you get to a point that him and Rodgers, particularly with Rodgers' personality, you know, you can only stay someplace so long, Greg. But you look at his record, it's incredible. The amount of division championship, Super Bowl. I mean, when you compare him to all these other guys people are talking about, it's not even close. You know, I worked with Mike at New England, at New Orleans. Uh, we battled one another in practice for four years. I was the D.C. He was the O.C. I, I know him extremely well. And, and I don't think Dallas could have made a better selection. And it's not because he's my friend. I think he brings a toughness. He's a Western Pennsylvania kid that came from nothing. He's never forgot it. He's tough without being, you know, without being abrasive. And he also is not a big ego guy, which is important in this thing. He's a guy that wants to coach the football team. He's not interested in the radio show. You know, he's not interested in all that stuff that goes with it. And, you know, I think that's really important when you're Jerry. He does, Mike is not a guy that's a control freak. He wants to control 
the game, the football game and that type of stuff, the X's and O's, and do that kind of stuff. He also, I think, will give them instant credibility. It's funny, and I think I mentioned this to you, I, Jim Haslett and I interviewed Mike when he was a, he was our quarterback coach. We were looking for a coordinator and I was the assistant head coach to Jim, and he, Jim had just taken over, and we couldn't find – we had interviewed hot tickets, and we couldn't find him. And I sat in on the interview with uh, McCarthy, and he impressed us so much. And so, you know, we, we slept on it. We kept him there all night. And so the next morning, Jim gets me and says, all right, I want you to get after him. I want you to try to upset him and see how he reacts because I really like him. So I did. I, I I did my best. I I got kind of in his face, and he jumped out of that chair and says, "Who the hell do you think I am?" You know, it was. <laughs> you no, know, it's a true story. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I said, you know, you're a big passing guy. So if Jim tells you to run the ball 30 times and Will, Ricky Williams or Deuce, what are you going to do? Pow! Oh, and he jumped up in his. And when he jumped in the air, we both looked at one another and said, "We said you got the job." <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story. And that's it. You know, and then he went on to do a great job with us and. And on and on and on, but I I think that is really really a good fit. I honestly do. Belichick, Brady, Bissett, and not to mention Anthony Casanzo. Those are all things we'll talk about in our next segment of the show. We'll put Coach on hold. One final segment with Coach for today. When we come back here on ninety three five and one zero seven five, the fan. Booth becoming a Morse Reservoir All Star and earning status as an ambient player. It's time for the best of Coach Rick Venturi with a breakdown of yesterday's game. Brought to you by the District Tap. Craft beer on tap and damn good food. North at 82nd Street, just east of Keystone at the Crossing. And now downtown at Georgia Street and Meridian. You heard what Dan had to say about Tom Brady to Indianapolis. I guess I could get to that question with Rick Venturi, who rejoins us now on the program. But I want to start with the potential dissolution of the most successful coach and player marriage of all time. 20 years, 19 as starting quarterback and head coach. Do you really think that Tom Brady has played his last game for the New England Patriots? I don't think so, but it's not out of the question. You know, Bill is... Uh, Bill is hard nosed and there's a ruthlessness to him that that makes him good. I mean, he is uh, in that sense. He, you know, there's there's no loyalty. It's how you play for me today. Uh, what you have left. Uh, this is the way we're going to do it. I I saw him cut Bernie Kosar, who was a Cleveland icon, as you know. Uh, right in the middle of the season uh, because he didn't think that he could win any longer, and he went on. I mean, I've seen him do this time and time again. I was, I was not totally surprised that, you know, that he, he, does, he doesn't want to talk about a, a decision. But for a guy who a lot of people is the greatest of all times, it, it, it wasn't much of an endorsement, that's for sure. It was a zero endorsement. Um, logic, though, tells you when all the smoke clears – is the best move for Brady is really to stay right there in New England. Why would he really, you know, really, I mean, upset or not, I mean, he's got, he's totally into the system. Uh, he knows exactly what it takes for him. You know, I, I say with the possible exception, if he were to follow Josh McDaniel some, you know, somewhere where, you know, the two of them has also had a symbiotic relationship. And so the system then remains in place wherever they were to go. Um, but you know, other than that, but I mean, you already got a quarterback at Cleveland. You already got a young quarterback at, at New York. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I think, I mean, logically the best fit for Brady is still new England. And honestly, Bill doesn't have, he really doesn't have a viable alternative if he lets Brady walk, because he really doesn't have an heir apparent, you know, they've all been kind of washed out, you know, and they all were going to go because they, none of them were going to sign the second contract with new England. Uh, I don't know about Brissett, but I know Jimmy G wasn't sure. because he was going to get big money and, and Bill is never going to lose you for nothing. You're always going to get something. And he knew he wouldn't be able to sign him the second contract, um, you know, but he doesn't have a, a viable alternative. So, you know, that's a, uh, you know, that's a dilemma in a sense, I also think that Bill is probably, you know, having to defense these great young kids who come in here and, you know, not only, you know, a lot of them we're going to see this weekend, 
um, you know, not only have great ability to throw the ball, but they stress a defense and they add so much to an offense. The, you know, the, the plays that you can add to your offense, the ad lib, and I'm sure that he's, you know, intoxicated with that. But you're, those guys don't grow on trees. You know, there's, it's not like there's 40 of them coming out. You know, there's one or two a year, and I'm not sure that that guy. I mean, there's, you know, the two best quarterbacks, the two best quarterbacks in college football, no matter what anybody says because of Tua's injury, are the two kids playing Sunday night. I mean, Monday night. I mean, that, that's the two best quarterbacks, Trevor Lawrence and Joey Burrow. That, those are the two – Though to me, those are the two best prospects since Andrew Luck in terms of NFL prospects on that day. Because even when people drafted Mahomes and Deshaun and Lamar, there were questions. I mean, nobody said those guys were sure things. Now, they've ascended. I mean, they've gone beyond that expectation. My God, they, you know, they, they've hit heights that we, nobody would have believed that quickly. But in terms of actual guys ready on that day, it's those two guys. So, you know, quarterbacks just don't grow on trees. It's, it's, it's hard to get them. I mean, and, you know, that's going to be Ballard's issue regardless. I mean, you know, the, this franchise, we can say what we want. This franchise in 20 years is a great franchise. But when they haven't had a franchise quarterback, they've had losing seasons, period. One more question on Brady before we move on. Yeah. And, again, because it's just, it's just so fascinating thinking that perhaps this marriage is over, perhaps that run is is over, and I know you touched on the fact that their offense is built on a triangle, and they didn't have that third leg of the triangle. Right. Of their struggles this year, how much of that do you put on Brady? In other words, how much does he have left in the tank, whether he's playing for the Patriots next year or somebody else of 31 NFL teams? You know, it's, it's, it's really hard to say. You know, I mean, that is hard to say. The offensive line was banged up a lot. Uh, it'll get better there, but it was banged up a lot. He does not have escapability. You started to see that come apart. Um, as great as he is, and, and he probably is the greatest of all times, but you know he is a system guy to a degree, very much a numbers-to-numbers numbers guy within that system. They've created that quick rhythm game for him, that play action. And you know to say that he is just going to walk to someplace else and all of a sudden become the MVP with that team, it, 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 that's an interesting question. And I'll tell you one thing. If you take a, a Brady, <laughs> you, you, you're not going to know what pressure is till you get him here if you're a coaching staff you, and, and a GM. You won't know what pressure is till all of a sudden he's your quarterback. <laughs> all right, so the Colts are going to make a move at quarterback in some form or fashion. I think we all feel pretty confident that it's, whether it's free agent, whether it's in the draft, regardless of round, there will be one added to the roster in March or April. What what would you what would your preferred path be? What do you think Chris Ballard's preferred path is going to be? Well, you know, I, I, if if I had a guy that I thought you know could come in and make the difference, and you're you 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 know, there's there's probably four guys on that list. I mean, you have to say Brady is an outside possibility, regardless of the discussion we just had. Uh, is Rivers a possibility? Rivers. You know, Rivers, both Brady and Rivers fell off the deep end. They went from 6 and 7 QBR to, to uh, you know, to what, 17th and 21st. I mean, they, they both had a tremendous drop-off season. Now, Rivers, believe it or not, is a really good fit here because he played for Frank and for Sirianni in San Diego. So, you know, he's a guy that instantly comes in and knows the playbook and you really probably don't have to do much. Now, the problem with both of them, here's the problem with both of them. The one thing we take for granted with Brissett is Brissett has got the hell knocked out of him again this year, whether it was blitzing. We did not protect like we did a year ago, and that kid got us out of trouble. He took hits. He, he extended plays with his legs. Neither one of those guys is going to do that. You got me? It's not going to happen. Right. So – you know, you, you, you then have to look around. I'm not a big Bridgewater fan. I, I mean, I, I mean, he's a backup guy that, that you, Sean Payton won in spite of Bridgewater, not because of Bridgewater, if you want to know the truth. It's not those kinds of guys. Would I be interested in Cam Newton? Yes, I would be. You know, I can't imagine they'll part with him. You're going to have to pay a lot of money. You gotta, he's, he's a guy you have to handle. 
uh, you know, I don't know. You know, uh, you know, a guy like Andy Dalton has had some big, you know, a, a couple big years. Not, you know, not the playoff guy and all that, but he's got talent. He's got some numbers. Personally, what you'd really like to do is be creative and really move up in the draft. But here's your problem. Basically, you've got three guys. You've got five guys, but there's a big separation between the top three and the bottom two that people are talking about first-round guys. Joey Burrow will be off the board immediately. He ain't going to get to number one. So Cincinnati, by being lousy, is going to look out. They're going to luck out, and they're going to end up with the guy right there. Then Tua, who would be right there, one and one A, I mean, that's a serious injury. I mean, you, you know, he, not, he might fall to you at 13 because of the injury, and then you've got you, you to gotta make a medical decision. Do we do this uh, and, and, and bet on the high side and realize that we might go with Jacoby another year because he may not be ready, but we may have something very special down the road? I mean, that's something you've got to be thinking about. Because because of the injury, he's a guy that could slide, and yet the injury may be something you don't want to touch. And then Herbert, you know, is probably the way I figured it. If you almost have to go, you almost have to get up to number six to ensure one of those three guys, unless Tua just slides. But if he doesn't slide, I think those three guys will go in the top six. Herbert, to me, I know the I know less about him than the other two. He remind, I, mean, I started to watch him here this week. Uh, he reminds me a little bit of Sam Bradford. He's got all great numbers and everything, and yet it's not always consistent. He's not the kind of guy that can come in and take the room over. Uh, and so that worries me a little bit. I was in St. Louis when Bradford right. came in there as number one, and he had it all. He had what looked like he had it all, you know, but – you know, there was always something missing there. So, and I do agree with Chris on this: is you can't, you can't manufacture it. You can't. I mean, you can't reach for that guy. You have to totally. If you're, if you're going, even if you're in the lottery, when you take a quarterback, you have to totally believe in that guy. And it has to go beyond tape. It has to go beyond numbers. You know, there, I always call it the electricity test. That, that's a guy. First of all, he has to have all the skill. Or he's not going to be up there. But then number two, you got to look in that guy's eye, and at some point in the eleventh hour, you got to say, hey, "I'm gonna bet on this guy," <laughs> you know. But it's, and but the problem is, is if you don't have that franchise, you look at all, you look at the top eight teams now, including Tannehill. Every every quarterback's in the top fifteen in terms of QBR. I mean, it's you're not you're not going to go very far without a great quarterback and that's that's been proven here so you know that that creates a whole lot of work ahead here as far as jacoby is concerned what issues that we saw especially at the end of the year are fixable slash correctable and what are the ones are just something you kind of go it is what it is that's what you deal with yeah you know that's a that's a really good question you know we you know, and I know everybody makes excuses for 217, and you know that's fine. I mean, we can we can write it off. You know, you, those are that's kind of a convenient write off if you really really like him. And I and I like his intangibles so much. I, you know, I want him to be good, man. When we were five and two, I was saying, please God, keep this up. But you know, over 34 games, over. Um, Every day that I watched practice in preseason, when I saw him day in and day out, you know, there's just the four, there's just the three issues. Decisiveness, I think you can improve, and and I think there were times in games, yes. Um, number two, uh, the accuracy and the delivery. I I don't know. I I think you can shorten the delivery. The problem is, is you don't have them as much in the off season. Um, you know, Rodgers came into the league, speaking of a guy that, you know, he had a long delivery. And because he sat for three years, they worked on delivery over three years, and he got quicker. I think Jacoby has a real body delivery. It's not a long arm. He's not a Jim Bunning guy, but he's, it's, a, it's a big, torquey range guy. And I think that it affects where it affects him. I think, first of all, people see it, and they can break on it pretty well. Uh, but number two, I think it affects touch. In other words, he's always got to have that body into it. So at the last minute when he goes to flick it, he's still throwing it 100 miles an hour. I don't know if that's going to change or not. You know, I don't know if accuracy, 
you, you know, I, I don't know. Somebody told me once, you know, you know, the way that kid picked up that rock and he threw it the first time is the way he's going to throw it 30 years from now. And I, I just, I don't know. Now, where I think there's a higher ceiling on Jacoby, I, I think he kind of is who he is as a quarterback, honestly. But I think where the ceiling could help him is that we, you know, once Hilton went down, and I mean, you know, credit T.Y. for playing through it and, you know, hanging in there and posting up. But once T.Y. went down, which was early, and then Ebron went down, I mean, we had nothing. I, and and I, I, listen, guys can tell me about all these guys and, all you know, guy, you know, this, I'm not going to mention names, but we got guys that are basically threes at best. And he had absolutely – We one of our big issues besides Jacoby was total lack of separation. And, you know, we have no way that we couldn't stretch the defense. So if you could surround him with some guys that can really play – you know, and, and, and now you, the, the good news is this. The good news is this. Already – I've already gone through some early stages of my draft work. I don't hit it hard till February, but there's, you know, basically everybody is saying, and I think it's legit that there's six to eight guys receivers going to go in the first round. Now, unfortunately, you know, we walked by some pretty good guys. We, you know, and I'm not talking about the first round. The only guy that we couldn't have got on the first round who had a good rookie year is Marquise Brown, but we walked by Medcalf, Debo Samuels, A.J. Brown, and Terry McLaren all had great, great rookie years. So I don't want people to tell me, well, you can't play as a rookie as a receiver. You might right. not be able to play for the Colts, but that myth has been broken. I mean, we walked by five guys to take you sin, four guys that all had really good rookie years. So we didn't help ourselves there. And, you know, if you're going to if you're going to help him out, it, you're going to have to help him with guys that can run, guys that can get open, um, you know, guys that can create, Greg. And I, and I think if you look at it that way, I'm not sure you're going to over-improve him. I, I think, again, decision-making will always get better the more he plays. He's always going to play tough. Uh, he's got the big arm. I'd like to see him become a little bit more reckless. You know, he gets off that deep ball quick, uh, all that kind of stuff. But I think the best thing you could do for him is two things, is surround him with better perimeter players, He's played with nothing since Hilton and Ebron went down. And then number two, our blitz pickup is subpar, and it was subpar in the preseason. Uh, individual pass protection, not bad, but our, our, our blitz pickup was bad from beginning to end. He had to avoid so many hits, and he took so many hits, and that's got to change. All right, so with that, an issue that maybe the Colts didn't think they would have, and they're not sure if they will have, is trying to replace a left tackle. I'm not going to try to get inside, say to get inside the mind of Anthony Costanzo, but if he doesn't come back, how does that change everything this offseason for this football team? Oh, that's a monster. You know, I just hope against hope that they can get that worked out. I mean, you know, I've said this all along. There, there's no question that Quentin Nelson is a is a monster and is the best football player up front and one of the best football players in the league. But the most significant lineman is our left tackle. I mean, you can play without a left guard. You cannot play without a really good left tackle. And Anthony has worked his way up into the top tier of of the NFL as a, as an offensive tackle. He certainly won me over, and he's healthy enough to keep playing. The only thing I do, you know, I do worry about. Number one, I think they can get it worked out financially. If it comes down to that, I'll be I'll be really upset if they don't. Right. Because if they don't, I mean, left tackles are like quarterbacks. They're like great edge rushers. Um, you know, they're they're the they're the premium guys. They go in the top ten. I mean, that's you know, you go edge rusher, quarterback, and left tackles. Those are your three highest drafted guys percentage wise in the league and I mean so you now if you don't get him you've opened up a hole as big as quarterback and so all of a sudden you need a quarterback a receiver a left tackle that would be really rough on your franchise so I hope they can get him signed the only thing I know is is I do worry in the sense when a guy talks about retiring when he's a smart guy I don't think he's a manipulator and I remember way back this may be too old for you but we had a good defensive end here back in the 80s when we first moved here, named Donnell Thompson, one of the better players, actually one of the better defensive ends in, you know, Colt history, you know, you know, obviously behind uh, Freeney and Mathis and those guys, but it was a different era. 
And, you know, Donnell was a guy that didn't come off as a, you know, like he was a, a road scholar, but he was a very, very sharp guy. And he had bought in. He had gotten into the minority program, McDonald's, and he had a couple. He had the first one in Atlanta, then he got his second one. And he was still young, and he threatened not to play. And I remember everybody telling me, Rick, uh, yeah, he's going to miss that paycheck. He'll be there. And I kept saying, guys, I'm telling you. That guy is serious now. He's got other things he's going to do. So, you know, I do have that in my, the back of my mind. But, you know, the other thing is, and I said this the other night with John, is, you know, you got you got to, you got to give it a little bit of time because this season was hard on everybody. You know, if you if you would take a poll, an attitude poll at the end of last year, at the end of 18, and then you take an attitude poll at the end of 19, it's totally different. Now, if guys are honest with you, because the greatest line in the world is that little psychologist in the natural who says losing is a disease. <laughs> and it is. And it, it, I've had enough of it myself. It eats away at you. And, it, you know, you come out of there and you have negative feelings everywhere. So your first indication is, you know, when a season goes like it did, particularly the debacle of Jacksonville, the first thing is just I'm glad this thing is over. I'm going to tell you what. I felt that way, to be honest with you. After Jacksonville, I just looked at Sherry and said, I'm glad this is over right now. I can't watch it anymore. But then you start to come back and you start to see the good things and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I'm hoping is that time heals that a little bit and uh, they can do a good job with him because he's just – he's so vital. I mean, you're not – you're not going to replace him out without a humongous investment. And that doesn't even mean there's going to be somebody there. It's just like the quarterback position, the left tackle, quarterback, and great edge rusher do not grow on trees. My friend, the fact that as an interim head coach twice in the National Football League and the former head coach at Northwestern in the 70s, the fact that you are as sane as you are is a <laughs> medical miracle. There is no doubt about that in my mind. Well, I pre- I'm not sure how to take it. That's but a compliment. I, I, That's a compliment I to you, Rick. I, <laughs> I think I grew from every experience as a human being. <laughs> no doubt about that. It is always a pleasure. Don't be a stranger. Let's talk before you head south, okay? All right. I will, Greg. You have a good one. You got it, buddy. Rick Venturi joining us courtesy of the District Tap. That is known as the easiest hour of radio in the city of Indianapolis every time he joins me. And, John, thanks for taking a day off on a Monday because you just gave me 60 minutes that uh, I said to just back up and get out of the way.